Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending where you are. So my name is Chiang Zhao, and I'm Associate Professor of International Education at the Faculty of Education, York University, and also I'm a Faculty Associate of the York Center for Asian Research, or WICA. So today I will serve as the moderator at this event. First and foremost, I thank you sincerely uh, for your participation. And I look forward to lively and inspiring interactions during next one and a half hours. So today we will first have a presentation provided by Professor Jenny Lee and Michelle Jie Lee from University of Arizona on the topic, near racism against Chinese scientists and the consequences for the scientific enterprise. It is based on the survey administered jointly by University of Arizona and the Committee of 100. And Professor Lee and Merce Lee co-authored a notable survey report titled Racial Profiling Among Scientists of Chinese Descent and the Consequences for the US Scientific Community, which is available and downloadable at the uh, Committee of 100 website. So following that presentation, we have a discussion about what's going on in Canada. So first of all, let me introduce today's uh, keynoters. Um, Dr. Jenny Lee is a professor in the Center of the Study of Higher Education and a Dean's Internationalization Fellow at the University of Arizona. She's co-editor of the book series, Studies in Global Higher Education. She formerly served as NAFSA at a senior fellow, US Fulbright Scholar to South Africa, and a chair for the Council of International Higher Education and the Board of Directors for the Association of the Study of Higher Education, ASH. Her research focuses on the internationalization of higher education based on her comparative research in the US, Southern Africa, and East Asia. Dr. Lee's expertise is regularly sought by the major news outlets, including the National Public Radio, Nature, Science, and New York Times, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Her latest research focuses on the geopolitics of global science, which is covered in her award-winning edited book, U.S. Power in International Higher Education, published by Lutgers University Press in 2021. Xiaojie Li um, is a, a PhD student and a graduate associate in the Center for the Study of Higher Education at the University of Arizona. She has published research articles on international student mobility and experience, um, transnational education, and intellectual migration. Her recent research was Dr. Jenny Li examines racial and ethnic equity in science. Uh, I will introduce the discussions after the presentation. So now, Dr. Lee and Shouji, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just give me a few moments to share my screen. Can you all see this? Yes. Thank you, Shouji. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you for the warm introduction and thank you all to make this time. Uh, there's so many webinars every day and throughout the week, so we appreciate you choosing this one. Um, especially uh, exciting because if you haven't read or heard already, the U.S. Department of Justice announced yesterday the end of the China initiative. And as we'll talk about, this is not necessarily the end, but this is certainly a, a very significant milestone. We're proud of the fact that this research that we're about to present was widely publicized and cited in major news outlets throughout the US and even abroad um, and helped to inform the end of this damaging initiative. This study demonstrates the power of research in making a positive difference. And we certainly recognize that the work is far from over, um, but still highly, highly relevant as we will discuss at the end. 
So on the next slide, this presentation focuses on the US and we will discuss the situation in Canada at the end. But you may notice some similar themes that are readily applicable readily applicable. Uh, in the case of the US, uh, there's been a dramatic rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents. In a study of top major cities in the United States, you'll see the rise of exponential hundreds of times over the past year. Um, Xiaoji, I think that you're looking at an old version of the slides. This is um, not the latest version that I sent. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, stop sharing for now. Okay, all right. But um, as she's talking, uh, you can certainly, if you don't mind just watching me as, uh, as I'm carrying on. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier, in the case of the United States, there has been a dramatic rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents. And oftentimes it's important to contextualize the research that we do in light of major movements, social events, and in this case, anti-Asian hate, um, which was coinciding with the China initiative, as well as the political rhetoric uh, that especially uh, was pronounced during the Trump administration in ways that China in particular was being uh, blamed for the COVID-19 virus with various um, terms that aren't worth repeating here, but we've all pretty much have, have heard. And in ways that much of this had came, come together to fuel uh, the, the initiative that um, underlied the study. And so in the major studies, there was a rise exponentially, 100 times over the past year of anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents. Uh, this is also happening in smaller towns in the US, even in universities. In Tucson and Arizona, where I live, uh, a close Asian colleague of mine was run over by a car. And the same day was identified by the police as having done, this car was um, identified as having done the same to another Asian earlier that day. Uh, this person has still not been found. And so statistics suggest as many as one in five Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders experienced a hate crime in the past year. So how does this all tie into higher education and what we're talking about now? So if you're not familiar already, in 2017, China has, uh, was recognized as the world's largest producer of scientific articles, surpassing the US. And this of course coincides with China's fast rising economy and R&D investments. And meanwhile, geopolitical tensions between the US and China have been mounting. And then President Trump at the time had called for a report based on the presumption that China had a negative impact on the United States. And so following this uh, inquiry, uh, the report indicated that China's rise in power uh, was quoted as a form of economic aggression. That was the term that was used in the report and that China was being positioned as a threat to the US and globally. Um, and then within that report, there was special attention that was paid to universities as being vulnerable targets. This was the, the term again that was used to describe universities as very open, but at the same time, uh, a place where the Chinese spies can il infiltrate and um, take secrets, intelligence, collect information that could then be used against the United States. Um, Xiaoji, are you able to get the slides? I think she's- uh, Yes, this is my moment. Okay, thank you. This, um, the slide is the China Initiative. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Is, is this one? Uh, the previous one. Okay. okay. And keep going forward. Sorry, oh. everyone. So is the next one? Next one. And one more. All right, perfect. Thanks everyone for your patience. Sometimes technology goes against what, no matter how much we prepare. Um, but I appreciate, thanks Xiaoji for your help. So the China Initiative, this is um, FBI Director Christopher Wray, uh, was born in 2018. And the initiative focuses on protecting our critical infrastructure against external threats, combating covert efforts to influence the American public and policymakers without proper transparency with a focus exclusively on China. 
And since that time, universities have been under considerable pressure in the United States from the FBI, as well as federal granting agencies to closely monitor potential espionage occurring on their campuses. And among these have been uh, ways to more strictly enforce conflict of interest disclosures, which have some implications as we'll talk about in the end. Um, so onto the next slide. Uh, what you're seeing here are just some of the many high profile cases that have reached US mainstream media. Most recently, Dr. Chen's case was dropped due to a lack of evidence, but, and for some others as well, these are cases that were dropped, exonerated. And what you may know as well is that their professional careers and reputations were greatly damaged in the process. Um, we also don't know though how many uh, not named are, are include Chinese scientists who may have suddenly left, um, who may have returned to China because they simply could not afford the legal expenses or were under pressure because they did not have permanent legal status. Those on temporary visas may have been prone to simply leave then face criminal charges, um, not because they were necessarily guilty because of their insecure residency positions and a lack of rights or an understanding of their rights. Also across these cases, university responses highly varied. Uh, the case of Dr. Chen of MIT, whose legal bills were fully funded, um, the MIT president making numerous statements in support of Dr. Chen in the Chinese community. And then Dr. An Ming Hu, who was fired by the University of Tennessee, even though was not found guilty. And after that court case and a lot of public protests was eventually permitted to return. These names are not coincidentally Chinese, nor is a Chinese initiative probing new. Actually, if we look back over the past 15 years, looking at court cases involving economic espionage, Asians were twice as likely to be falsely accused and punished twice as severely compared to non-Asians and only 3% involved academia. And in a more recent study, looking at China initiative cases directly, nine and 10 defendants were of Chinese heritage. And yet these cases uh, did not demonstrate that there was systematic um, espionage occurring from uh, the PRC. They happened to be of Chinese descent, but the uh, violations had more to do with administrative procedures, false reporting, lack of reporting, but no evidence of systematic spying from China. So as a point of context, this is not isolated to the US. There are media concerns, just a couple of examples here in Australia, as well as the UK as examples. So as a way to offer some conceptual framing, given this is a, my previous talks have been for more uh, global general audiences and given this is um, a, an academic institution, I thought we might offer some conceptual framing. So why China and why now? Uh, this is a concept that I'm using to frame this work. And this was introduced to the field about 15 years ago, still applies today. And the photo here, for those of you who may not be old enough to remember um, the ways that Middle Eastern um, heritage individuals were treated post 9-11 under the Patriot Act. Um, this is an earlier example of neo-racism. And for those of you who can remember, uh, anyone who barely looked Middle Eastern were not only randomly attacked, but also without due process under this banner of national security, which I refer to as neo-racism, which is not solely based on the color of one's skin, but also includes one's culture and negative stereotypes about their country of origin in a globalizing world. So beyond traditional racism, neo-racism is used to justify preserving one's national culture that sees outsiders as threats. Unlike xenophobia, neo-racism maintains global hierarchies of oppression so that those of European descent, for example, are not seen as dangerous or as criminals, unlike communities of color from the global South. 
We see this in Trump's Muslim ban, which he stated that he would prefer um, more immigrants from Norway, but uh, policies that had severely restricted those from Muslim majority countries at the same time. Although reversed under President Biden, selective stereotyping is still occurring. The next slide shows some of the past research on how neo-racism surfaces in university settings. And I'll skip over these examples. Um, they're referenced and happy to make them available. But when it comes to scientists, my work with Brendan Cantwell showed how the US and UK, for example, um, were able to maintain our scientific global positioning through its ongoing supply of Asian postdocs and in temporary contracts. But they are hardly groomed towards permanent faculty positions, unlike their white European counterparts. And in the latest, of course, having to do with the treatment of Chinese scientists in the US, as part of the China initiative, there are concerns that the CCP was taking away US intelligence through their talent programs. So what's interesting and selective about this is that Germany, France, UK, other countries regularly offer incentives to collaborate, to recruit talent, but they have not been targeted anywhere close to the same way. So in the next slide, the power of research uh, in order, besides uh, hoping to change legislation and bad policy is also to dispel myths. And this is a tip I offer to any graduate students in the audience. So much of the political rhetoric uh, during the time of the, the work and that you may have heard or read about positions China as quote unquote stealing. China is taking away, they're spying. Um, they're here to take away the intelligence that is rightfully uh, earned and created in the United States. But when you actually look at the research, what you see is a very different story. So if you can see the graphs, the two upward lines is China and the two flat lines is the United States. And this is demonstrating scientific production across time. As shown by China's two top lines, their productivity has gone up with the US and without the US. So the top line is with and the second line is without. Now the bottom two lines is the US and you'll see that they're relatively flat. The upper line shows that China is supporting US research and there's a slight incline if you can see that towards the end. But you can see that without China on the very last line, the line is more flat. In other words, the US needs China more than China needs the US when it comes to scientific production, despite the political rhetoric that we're surrounded by. So given this context and major consequences for the US, this leads to our study purpose, which is to understand how the China initiative was influencing the everyday actions and opinions of the broader scientific community, scientists of Chinese descent compared to those who are not Chinese. And we did the study because there was also a lot of anecdotal reporting in the news about how this is the China initiative is hurting the US. This is not good for science. This is uh, devastating lives and this is racial profiling. And yet there was no evidence to that. And so we were happy to embark upon this work um, supported by the Committee of 100. And so I'll now turn it over to Xiao Ji Li, who will now go into the most important part, which are the methods and the findings. Thank you so much, Jenny. And let me first explain about our survey data collection process. Uh, so basically it took four steps. Uh, first, we generated a list of 83 top universities in the US. These universities were selected if they were ranked in the top 50 universities by either the Times Higher Education's Research Score, Citation Score, or a QS uh, Citations per Faculty in 2021. Second, we used a uh, web uh, scraping method to extract a full list of scientists from those universities. Uh, that list included over 75,000 uh, faculty members, post postdocs, and graduate students. Uh, after that, we separated the scientists list based on whether one has a Chinese last name or not. 
the Chinese name group had about 14,000 scientists and the non-Chinese name group had about uh, 61,000. The purpose of uh, this step was just to oversample uh, Chinese scientists. So in the last step, we distributed the survey to the entire Chinese name group and a random sample of the non-Chinese name group. The survey was anonymous and each respondent self-identified whether they were Chinese or not. So our analysis is based on their self-identified data instead of their names. But we, we like to note here that the term Chinese we use here refers to any individuals of Chinese descent or heritage, regardless of their citizenship or geographic location. So in our final sample, 46% uh, were Chinese and 54% were non-Chinese, so about like half and half. Um, also based on their uh, self-reported data, about half were faculty members, close to 10% were postdocs, and nearly 40% were graduate students. In terms of their citizenship, 58% were US citizens and 42% were foreign nationals. Okay, our findings. First of all, uh, scientists reported a high level of interactions with Chinese graduate students, postdocs, and professors. In particular, over 90% of the scientists, including both Chinese and non-Chinese, interacted with Chinese graduate students and professors at least once a year. In the US, uh, China is still the top one international student sending country, despite the negative impact of COVID-19 on international international student mobility, still over 118,000 Chinese graduate students enrolled in the U.S. higher education during the 2020 to 2021 academic year. Also, the five-year stay rate of Chinese science and engineering doctoral recipients in the U.S. was over 80% by 2017. Given such mobility patterns, it is not surprising to see that in scientists interact with Chinese students and scholars at a regular basis. In terms of uh, their research collaborations with China, half of the sci Chinese scientists and about one third of the non-Chinese scientists indicated that they conducted international uh, collaborative research involving China over three years. These percentages are quite high to us. Um, both Chinese and non-Chinese scientists highly value Chinese scientists and the research collaborations between the US and China. An overwhelming percentage of the scientists believe that the Chinese scientists made important contributions to research and teaching programs in their field. And the US should build stronger research collaborations with China and as for their own research, still around 80% of them perceived that collaborating with Chinese scientists was important. This percentage is slightly lower, which is understandable given their perceived importance of uh, collaborating with Chinese scientists depends on their specific fields and also research projects. Also very similarly, over 90% of the scientists in the sample agreed that limiting um, collaboration with China had negative impact on academia, their academic discipline, as well as their own research projects. Uh, there were barely differences between uh, Chinese and non-Chinese scientists. Uh, such results demonstrate that supporting research collaborations, including those with China, is a common value held by all scientists, regardless of their nationality or field. In their own words, a Chinese uh, American professor of mathematics said, I believe science has no boundaries. The US has been open to all research collaborations in the past, and this has been the reason that the US has maintained its, its leadership. Research collaboration has been most beneficial to the US because of its superior education and research management system. The US has no reason to fear the competition from China and also a non-Asian American professor of engineering emphasized the collaboration was critical to knowledge and advancement. This professor said, as we move into space exploration and understanding, working together with experts from China will accelerate the advancements to come. To not work uh, together with China will greatly suppress the pace and the impact of space initiatives. It will be a substantial setback. 
the 21st century is for the first time a potentially united world in a broad sense. This is why connecting to China is so critical for all humanity. However, even though scientists generally agreed on the value of Chinese scientists and, non, and the US-China research collaborations, our uh, survey also found that there were concerns about intellectual properties threat posed by China and the Chinese scientists. Unfortunately, 75% of the non-Chinese scientists believe that the US should be tougher on China to prevent the theft of intellectual property. And 44% believe that academic espionage and intellectual threat uh, theft in academia among Chinese scientists was a serious issue. Even though most of the charges under the China Initiative was, were dropped or dismissed, as we observed noticeable uh, stereotypes against China and the Chinese scientists. One non-Asian professor of engineering commented, I would qualify China as a scientific polluter. Anyone that is familiar with what goes on in Chinese universities understands that the data is often fabricated. As a result, the Chinese do great damage to the scientific enterprise. And indeed, Chinese uh, scientists were more likely to suffer from racial profiling compared to non-Chinese scientists. 42% of the Chinese scientists reported feeling racially profiled by the US government. 38% of the Chinese scientists experienced more difficulty in obtaining research funding in the US as a result of their race, nationality, country of origin. Also, 38% of the Chinese scientists experienced a professional challenge as a result of their race, nationality, country of origin. And 51% of the Chinese scientists feel, feel uh, fear, anxiety of being severed by the US government. This percentage is quite alarming. And as a comparison, we can see that the corresponding percentages among the non-Chinese scientists group were much lower. So what do the stereotypes against China and Chinese scientists as, as well as Chinese scientists experience of being racially profiled mean to the US scientific enterprise? One of the consequences is that research collaborations with China were uh, limited and that the Chinese scientists particularly tended to cut such research ties. Among the scientists who engaged in international research collaboration among involving China over the past three years, 41% of the Chinese scientists limited communication with collaborators in China. 24% decided not to involve China in future projects. And 23% decided not to work with collaborators in China on future projects. Nearly 20% of the Chinese scientists had to prematurely or unexpectedly end or suspend research collaborations with scientists in China. We asked the reasons why scientists had to end or suspend their collaborations with scientists in China. The top reason uh, was self-distancing, uh, followed by travel bans or visa challenges, advice from their institution, different uh, research approach and the personality differences. This result shows that the China initiative did not only just ruin the lives and the careers of a small amount of um, in individual scientists, but has also imposed a chilling effect on the broader scientific community. From the scientists' the comments themselves, we learned that they avoided uh, collaborating with China due to their perceived risks. A Chinese American professor of geology, geological and earth scientist sciences said, I have to limit my com I have to limit my collaboration with Chinese scientists who are very important to my research. It also sets a horrifying environment as I worry that I'm going to be punished just because of I'm a Chinese American and have been in collaboration with Chinese colleagues. This makes my daily life very hard, even though I'm not, I'm only working on basic science. Non-Chinese scientists might also distance themselves from Chinese scholars to avoid potential trouble. One said, due to increasing intensity of warnings from our university administration along the lines of FBI's malicious intent comment, I stopped accepting any volunteer visitors from China to my group because I do not want to deal with any kind of investigations or issues in the future in case I get unlucky. 
In addition to self-distancing from collaborating with China and Chinese scientists, some scientists also cha has changed their uh, research strategies by avoiding sensitive topics. Uh, a Chinese American professor in physics said, I avoided working on potential sensitive topics and do not collaborate with groups uh, from weapons labs in the US. Many scientists also indicated that they avoided the federal funding as the federal funding agencies overly scrutinize uh, collaborations with China. A Chinese associate professor of, of environment science indicated, I'm less willing to pursue and be involved in research funded by um, federal or state government agencies as such research may uh, attract a special and unadjusted scrutiny by the government authorities. The US um, anti-China policies might also change the landscape of intellectual migration. As I mentioned earlier, the US has long attracted Chinese students to pursue their careers in the US. However, in the survey, we found that 42% of the Chinese scientists who are not US citizens indicated that FBI investigations and or the China initiative affected their plans to stay in the US. This potential talent loss is certainly concerning for the US. Among the scientists who considered living the US, uh, there were graduate students who were looking for a place to start their careers one student in geog geological and earth science said, before the China initiative was established, I have always been wanting to stay in the US for my career in academia. Now, after seeing so many Chinese scientists being wrongfully targeted uh, with the added hatred towards China, Chinese people fueled by the COVID-19 pandemic and the Donald Trump, I have decided not to pursue a long-term career in the United States. Meanwhile, we observed that established professors who had lived in the US for decades also give a second thought about their staying. For example, a Chinese science associate professor of chemistry said, as a Chinese professor who's trained and has been working in the US for nearly 20 years, these investigations and the restrictions against Chinese scholars make me feel unwelcome and somewhat discriminated. And I sometimes feel my Chinese identity may be the limiting factor for my career advancement in the US. In the past few years, I feel the first time since I've been in the US that Chinese scientists are not valued as much as before. And politics, and the politics is intervening uh, academic freedom. This makes me seriously consider moving to China if the current trend continues or wor even worsens. To uh, summarize our findings, uh, first, both Chinese and non-Chinese scientists highly value the US-China research collaborations. It is uh, scientist consensus that limiting such uh, collaboration has negative impact on science. However, there is a clear pattern that uh, Chinese scientists reported a greater uh, racial profiling and the fear and anxiety of being severed by the US government. Even though most of the China initiative cases were dropped and dismissed, as we mentioned before. We still observed that non-Chinese scientists tended to hold the stereotypes against China and uh, Chinese uh, scientists. And the consequences of the America's neo-racist policies for uh, scientific enterprise included scientists' the limited engagement with China. Due to perceived the risks and the fear, they self-distanced from uh, collaborations for, with China and avoided working with or host the Chinese students and scholars. Uh, they also stayed away from sensitive uh, research topics and federal funding. This means they might downsize their uh, research and work with domestic only research teams. Lastly, the anti-China um, political environment made many Chinese scientists consider to pursue their careers elsewhere, uh, which may potentially result in great talent loss for the US. And now I'm going to hand back to Jenny for uh, some discussions about implications. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we're proud to be among the key studies that inform the end of the China Initiative. In yesterday's address, Assistant Attorney General for National Security, Matthew Olson, 
introduced a more comprehensive plan that would not solely focus on China. And he made it clear that the China initiative gave rise to the perception that the Department of Justice is singling out anyone of Chinese heritage. And this, as Zhao Ji has shown earlier, was made true in our study. Um, even Chinese Americans, US citizens also felt targeted. Mr. Olson acknowledged what we found, which was a chilling effect, as Zhao Ji also described. In the end, the Department of Justice finally observed that the China Initiative was harming the US in ways that were counterproductive to their goals of trying to compete with China. So in closing, uh, questions remain as to whether or how racial profiling will continue. We know that neo-racism is not within law enforcement or in the courtroom alone. It occurs in classrooms, labs, and in a range of higher education settings. So what we do know and what we do need is ongoing clarification on federal as well as university policies. Uh, Xiaoji, you can just click so that they all appear. Um, what we do know is that we need policies so that, that are clear so that Chinese or any Asian faculty member does not feel unfairly targeted. This also means consistent reporting and transparency from our governments, as well as our university research offices. We also need racial climate research and ultimately continuing to ask the hard questions about how to maintain collaboration while also protecting national intellectual property. In closing, science and discovery is inherently borderless and key in assessing, addressing the world's problems. The China Initiative demonstrates what happens when geopolitics enter in and potentially threatens our pursuit of knowledge and academic freedom. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Li and Xiaoji um, for this wonderful um, presentation. And congrats to your um, such a substantial and solid uh, work. And the timing, as you said, time is perfect. Yeah, it's a, a one piece of co a contribution to the situation now, ending the China initiative. Um, we're gonna move on. We're gonna save the Q&A to the last. We're gonna move on. Unless you have any burning question uh, for Dr. Li and Xiaoji directly about their presentation. I do see one uh, in the Q&A. Uh, by the way, uh, when you ask your questions, please enter um, your questions in the Q&A. Um, I do see one um, in the Q&A. Um, I wonder whether Dr. Lee and Shoji, you want to address this question now, which is about, um, let me read the question. Uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. It will be interesting to see stats or hear your thoughts in regards to your sample. And, and Chinese Americans versus Chinese more broadly, and whether that has effect on the experiences of neo-racism. Do you have any comments on that? Um, we did a round like analysis um, to compare uh, uh, Chinese uh, nationals and also Chinese Americans. I mean, sorry about like those terms and just, you know what I mean. And uh, um, but we don't really see like a lot of differences uh, in terms of uh, citizenship, but still I'm not, I'm saying it in a very general way because there are so many points uh, in our uh, research. So I don't want to go to details and I don't have the analysis in front of me. So like, uh, please contact me uh, if you uh, wanted to see more details, I would say in this way, uh, but in general, we see more uh, differences between Chinese and non-Chinese along the uh, lines of ethnicity. Okay, uh, so we're gonna move on uh, to the, the, the discussions. Um, I will say a few words and to lay out the, the context or the background. Then we move on to introduce the discussions and, and also um, their talks. Um, it's just a few words to lay the, uh, the background. Um, um, you know, after the presentation, uh, we know uh, about the China Initiative. Uh, we know there is uh, no exact equivalent of China Initiative in Canada, but uh, there are a few things or practices uh, that may approximate uh, that effect. Uh, uh, for example, in 2020, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service 
weren't the Canadian universities and the research institutions that China is using academic talent recruitment programs, such as the Southern Talents Plan to attract scientists to China in hopes of obtaining cutting edge science and technology for economic and military advantage. A year later in July, 2021, uh, Canadian government imposed a mandatory national security risk assessment on funding re requests from university-based researchers to protect Canadian intellectual property from falling into the hands of authoritarian governments. So now the research is applying uh, for grants through the National Science and Engineering Research Council, or NSERC, how to complete a comprehensive security risk assessment. Any proposal assessed to be uh, having higher risk could fail to receive a government funding. Though the, the government um, requirements um, do not say or mention China by name, some argue the security review is clearly targeted at the Canadian academics of Chinese origin, as many of them have the research collaborations with China. So those two um, organizations representing the academics of Chinese origin in Canada, one is the Canadian Academy of Chinese Professors, and the second one is the Canadian Association of Chinese Professors. They released a statement saying that a new mandatory national security assessment for federal funding of university-based researchers could lead to racial profiling of Chinese researchers as foreign agents. Um, in addition, um, people could naturally wonder if um, any racial profiling among the Chinese uh, of Canadian academics of Chinese origin could uh, potentially create a chilling atmosphere in their work environment, affecting their teaching, supervising, and recruiting graduate students, as well as their professional development or community engagement. So um, for these reasons, uh, we're now uh, introducing this topic to Canada and try to find out if there's any difference uh, between Canada and the U United States, uh, given the traditional distinctions between the melting pot and the mosaic uh, multiculturalism. So we have uh, uh, three panelists today um, joining us for this discussion. So now let me introduce um, our panelists in the alphabetic order. Uh, so first, let me introduce Dr. Tony Fang. Um, Dr. Fang is the Stephen Jaroslowski Chair in Economics and the Cultural Transformation in Memorial University and an adjunct professor with the University of Toronto. He also hosts the J. Robert uh, based Faculty Fellowship in Rutgers uh, University and sits on the World Bank uh, Expert Advisory Committee on the migration and development. And he was a visiting professor at Harvard, a National Bureau of Economic Research at the Wharton School of Business and Chinese University, Hong Kong. Uh, he was invited by the Government of Canada as a member for the um, expert consultation on the private pensions in Canada and the task force for the review of Employment Equity Act. Uh, Act. In 2017, he was uh, made a fellow of Royal Society of Arts. He served as the president of Chinese Economist Society from 2012 to 2013, and a domain leader in Sirius Ontario Metropolis Center from 2009 to 2012. Now, his area of research interests um, focusing on the issues of migration, diversity and the cultural changes among many other things. Uh, so that's Dr. Tony Fang. Um, our second um, discussant, um, Dr. Jeremy Patil, is a professor of political sciences at Carleton University in Ottawa and head of the Carleton's Belt and Road Initiative Public Affairs Research Center. He is author of the Empire's New Clothes, uh, Cultural uh, Particularism, Particular, uh, particularism and university in China's rise to global status, published in 2007 by Paul Grave. Uh, with other colleagues, and he 
uh, co-edited a volume in 2015 titled Facing China as a New Global Superpower, Domestic and International Dynamics from a multi Multidisciplinary Angle. And a special issue of Canadian Foreign Policy Journal in 2016 on Canada and emerging markets. Dr. Patil has contributed numerous other articles on Chinese politics, East Asian foreign relations, and Canada-China relations. Um, last but not least, Dr. John Weiss, sorry, sorry, John Price, um, is a professor emeritus in history at the University of Victoria, where he taught for 21 years before uh, his retirement in 2018. He's the author of Japan Works, Power and the Paradox in Post-War Industrial Relations, published in 1997 by Cornell University Press. Uh, Orienting Canada, um, Race, Empire, and the Trans-Pacific, published by UBC Press in 2011, and a co-author of the biography, uh, A Woman in Between, Searching for uh, Dr. Victoria Chang. Uh, that was published in 2019. Uh, more recently, his work has focused on the uh, settler colon uh, colonialism and anti-racism and co-authored a special volume of BC studies uh, on settling the island, race, indigeneity, and the Trans-Pacific. Uh, Dr. Price is also a co-author of the recent booklet Challenging Racist British Columbia, 150 Years and Counting, published in 2021. So his opinion pieces are published regularly and widely, including the well-read eight-part series, Decolonizing Canadian Foreign Policy, uh, which is um, open access, you can download. Um, so I'm proud to say um, approximately the three discussions represent Canada from coast to coast to coast. Um, so now um, let's hear uh, their opinions. Uh, so each um, discussant will speak um, about 10 minutes. Shall we go the, with the alphabetic order as well? So uh, Dr. Fang, you, you go first. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Zha, also the York Center for Asian Research for the uh, invitation. It's a great honor to be uh, at this distinguished panel. Uh, to discuss this very important issue. And also would like to thank uh, Professor Lee and your research team for doing a great service to the, uh, both the scientists, also students of Chinese descent uh, in the United States and also uh, Canada. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that your convincing evidence has contributed to the recent decision of American government to end the so-called China Initiative based on the two main grounds. One is the grave concern for racial profiling and racial discrimination. Second being the damaging impact of the program on reputation and also the international collaboration of Amer American economic enterprise. So the in many ways, United States and Canada share many in common, but the two countries are to have distinct uh, history, culture, and law and order. From the, our constitution, the Charter Rights Freedom to human rights legislation and pay equity employment equity legislation, right? Canadian government has embraced the um, multiculturalism policy as opposed to Matt and Paul uh, model in the United States. And in fact, I'm currently sitting, as uh, Professor Zha uh, mentioned, uh, in the expert panel of, um, to review the employment equity legislation intended to protect uh, employment rights of various marginalized groups in Canada, including indigenous people, uh, racialized groups, women and people with disabilities. And we are working with the Canadian government to strengthen and reinforce the protection of a uh, racialized group, including black Canadians and also Asian Canadians who historically experienced 
significant uh, discrimination and disadvantages in our labor market and society. So uh, in thinking about uh, the ways how we protect uh, minor, minority, I think we should focus on, uh, you know, uh, what do you do, not what you are, right? Thinking about a few years ago, right? It is, you know, international collaboration has been encouraged by Canadian American uh, government. No, it creates this new China initiative, creates a lot of confusion, even fear among scientists and students of Chinese descent, right? Which also hurts uh, the reputation of the respective universities. And of course, we need to balance, right? The safeguarding intellectual property rights and preventing conflict interest. But it's also imperative to provide a safe environment and academic freedom so that the academics and the scientists can conduct their independent uh, in both social and natural sciences. And in answering the question, um, you know, um, Professor Jia asked before the panel, and uh, whether um, we have observed, uh, you know, the influence of uh, uh, racial profiling of our Canadian campuses. Of course, the uh, anti-Asian hate incidents has increased dramatically, both in the United States and also Canada in the last couple of years. However, I do not have direct evidence of such impact uh, in, for example, grant application in part probably because we conduct research in social sciences, not in this classic areas, right? Classified areas or, you know, natural sciences, which was imposed this new security regulation, right? And uh, if, on the other hand, we receive fewer uh, international students and a wisdom from China in the last two years. Again, I'm not certain whether this is caused by racial profiling or some other factors like uh, the pandemic effects, right? The visa restrictions and, um, and, and the travel uh, restrictions and all because the self-selection of the Chinese students and uh, visiting scholars. So on the other hand, I think we need to also emphasize, right? And uh, in, in, in both countries, um, we need to provide more clear guidance and communication, right? To our scientists, uh, both Chinese, non-Chinese, um, you know, in terms of what are the requirements, right? Uh, to prevent conflict interest. Right, the reporting requirements. And based on the report, the China Initiative has launched more than 2,000 investigations against the scientists of Chinese descent. However, the vast majority of cases were dropped due to uh, lack of uh, evidence, right? Being our immigrant to Canada for more than 20 years is unimaginable right, to see such policy to be adopted in Canada, to think out one single ethnic group or religious group, like, you know, we talk about Muslim ban or China initiative, right? This is our right racial discrimination, right? Or racial profiling. And, and, and in addition, there's no clear evidence to support that claim. And uh, so, to, to uh, conclude, I think, you know, uh, in Canada, you know, we are not there yet as we, we you know, our uh, scientist colleagues experience the United States, but still important to remain vigilant because uh, we observed some uh, uh, individuals, right, uh, driven by ideology have proposed somewhat kind of policy programs uh, in Canada. Right, and uh, so I, I think it's uh, really important to take concerted efforts, right, uh, among our academic colleagues, Chinese, non-Chinese, and our ed educational institution, and also legal authority 
right, to understand the complexity, right, the grave consequence of such racial profiling policy and programs, both in Canada, United States. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Fang. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Patio. And also, I want to um, alert the attendees. Um, if you have any questions, you can start um, answering your questions into the Q&A. We'll get ready for that. Dr. Patio. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not sure why I was asked, but as a political scientist, I think I, my job really is to give some political context. Um, I've just finished a piece that should be published in the next... Um, I don't know, over the next year about Canada-China relations um, over the last little while. And in that essay, I conclude that the um, two Michaels, well, the Meng Wanzhou and two Michaels case in Canada has changed the um, entire context of Canada-China relations. Uh, in 2018, I published an article called Canada and China Between Fear and Hope. Um, since 2018, it has gone from hope to fear. And so what you have seen um, since the, what sometimes we call the called three M's affair, um, Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels, is the complete securitization, as we use using a word in, in of political science, international relations, where in some sense the whole context of the relationship of Canada and China has now been almost um, you undimensionally turned towards security and away from other interests. Although formally speaking, a government talks about the four C's which is really adapted from the Biden administration's three C's, um, which is collaboration where possible, um, or cooperation is sometimes used cooperation, sometimes used collaboration, competition, confrontation where necessary. In the Canadian case, we also added coexistence. So we had four C's um, instead of three C's. But in fact, the adoption of this three C's is mostly competitive and um, confrontational and much less collaborative uh, and um, competitive, yes. And that's where I want to bring some other kind of identity context. So I think part of it um, has to do with the fear of the rise of China, especially in this thing, and it's very relevant to this panel. It's not because of what, I mean, some things that China does are threatening. But sometimes it's, it looks more like what China is. The fact that China is successfully competitive is the main cause of fear. And this is the underlying racialized, if you like, a dynamic that comes from successful competition. Um, now, this is a very sad day in world affairs. I don't want to minimize the fact that security is an important factor and that um, the security element in international relations is not something to overlook or ignore. Um, the Chinese state has in some cases taken a predatory approach to technology through cyber espionage and other forms um, and taken a rather nationalistic um, approach to competition. The legitimate question though, isn't whether we should look to our security, but rather how and why. And particularly, it is important in view of our rather um, sad history in some respects about racialization. Don't forget Chinese Canadians, Dr. Price will probably, Professor Price will tell you more about it, did not become full citizens of Canada until 1947. 80 years after the founding of our of, of our the Dominion of Canada. Okay. First Nations didn't become full citizens until 10 years later, 90 years after the founding. <laughs> so we do our, our history um, of, of racialization is has profound roots. Um, and 
what happens is when when the security equation comes in, the, and the, the racialization of security um, was actually promoted by none other than the head of the Canadian Security and Intelligence Agency, Dick Fadden in 2011, when he suggested that Canadians of Chinese origin in public office constituted in some ways a target of the Chinese government and perhaps a security threat. Now, in so far as Canadians of Chinese origin may be targeted by the Chinese state, they're victims. Victims, not, uh, not suspicious characters. But the, the, uh, Mr. Fadden should have been fired for saying that. He was kept in his job. As far as I'm concerned, if that, such a statement had been made about, for example, I am Jewish Canadian, if he had made such a statement about Jewish Canadians, suspecting their loyalty because they may be targeted by, <laughs> I think he would have been fired. But it's only in the context of this uh, deteriorating security relationship. Here I will add to the securitization thing. The fact remains that throughout the period of, the, we talked about the Hmong affair and the, the issue of Huawei in Canada, Huawei which maintained research relationship with about seven Canadian universities um, and substantial research capacity in Canada. The, there was unremitting pressure from the United States, from Washington to halt Canadians relationship with Huawei, to target Huawei as a, a, and with the threat, and this is important in terms of how these things influence Canada, the threat that was implicit or explicitly given that Canada would be cut out of the Five Eyes Intelligence Consortium, um, which brings together Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and Great Britain in intelligence sharing. And this was considered largely a threat to our intelligence gathering organizations. And this is the same organization, which is then pushing towards the greater securitization and relationship with China. There, there is, they are not necessarily um, objective bystanders, if you want to say this, in terms of this thing, they're looking about their own interests in terms of the, the bureaucratic politics of Canada. Now, um, I would, and in terms of, of research collaboration, um, Professor Jia knows better than I, or just as well as I, and I, I, I'm a student of China, Sino-Canadian relations. The Canadian government in the 1980s established as the hallmark of its um, program to help modernize China as part of our aid program, was the university linkage project. So university linkages between Canada and China were an initiative of Canada. That was a Canadian initiative and thousands of Canadian researchers and scientists and thousands of Chinese societies went back and forth through this linkage linkages where it's established directly, which continued into the 2000s. And so the research partnerships that we have with China were started by our initiative. Now, of course, the balance of power shifted in the 2000s as Chinese, um, first of all, China now graduates 9 million people a year from university, far more than any other country. Secondly, um, research funding has become much more generous in China. And Chinese labs are in some cases more advanced than their Canadian equivalents because they're better funded. And so therefore the, uh, the way in which these linkages work may have flowed back into it's much more interested for other people to come here. And at the same time, the Chinese students that we have attracted much as we saw in the, as in the United States things maintain relationships with their uh, home institutions that they came from before. And that was for a long time encouraged and seen as, as a multiplier in terms of our own technologic, to technological and other development. But this has suddenly shifted um, in the last few years. Now, I will say that there, 
the concerns should not be there. And I will say, I give you, I will give you a particular example that I was aware of. Um, I was a beneficiary of the Canada China Scholarly Exchange in the second group of people who came into China as a student in 1974. Um, and as far as collaboration is concerned, I was a student at Beijing University, Peking University in 1975. I, and I, I was a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in 2009, and I'm an adjunct, have an adjunct relationship with uh, uh, Central China uh, Normal University, Huazhong Shida, and with um, the uh, Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. You could say that I myself have these kind of suspect ties, if you want to call it that way. Um, now, these were considered a positive until a few years ago. Now, I must say that as far as I sat on the, the adjudication committee of the, of the, of the um, scholarly exchange a couple of years ago, now a couple of years ago, back, back in the, uh, before 2015, probably about 2012, 2013. And I did notice that in the scholarly exchange program, Unfortunately, there was not a requirement to undertake ethics review to apply to the program for the projects. And this was an oversight. And when I were reviewing some, a couple of cases, there were areas which I thought merited greater scrutiny. Um, and one of them, and these later came up in an article published in the Global Mail. Um, where they actually went over them. One had to do with unmanned aerial ve vehicles. Um, and, but people, interestingly enough, the pe scholars who wanted to go and do these kinds of research in China on unmanned vehicles were not Chinese Canadians. And the fact that no review was taken of the project was the oversight of the program, which was still jointly administered by Canada at that time. At that time, I raised the problem with, with Global Affairs Canada that there should be an ethics review. And perhaps in some cases of sensitive areas, there should be some further thing. But my suggestion was that this should be done as part of the normal ethical review process that all of us who do ethics review things, and perhaps some questions might be added to this as part of the tri-council's thing. Instead, what happened last July is that the new review figure is, is administered directly by our security agency. Well, you know, there's an old adage, to a hammer, everything is a nail. To a security agency, everything is a security threat. And so I think that this is very dangerous to academic research. I really appreciate our, the ethical, uh, the, first of all, the tri-council guidelines and the people in our administration who administer them. I think they do a good job and they help us in our research. If they were, if these things were administered within the universities by, you know, I don't mind if our security agents would help the Tri-Council develop these guidelines, but they should be done at arm's length and kept away from the intelligence, the intelligence agencies who are likely to impose a very heavy handed view on these things. And, may, and given the sad history of the former head of CSIS, Mr. Fadden, and how he targeted Chinese Canadians, I wouldn't trust them, to, to be fair on this. Now, I cannot end without bringing up the case that's the most notorious case in Canada, uh, the, the case of, of Dr. Chiu Xiang Guo and her husband, Dr. Chung Keding. I don't know much about the case, but the virus, but this has become a co celeb. But I would urge you all to read the recent article in McLean's magazine that came out February 15th. And this article makes it very clear that these were honest scientists um, whose relationship with China were initially above board and encouraged by the Canadian government. And that the reason that they came under scrutiny later had to do with internal policies having to do with intellectual property. And there's a lot of this so-called intellectual property. The question is, is intellectual, the intellectual property and security are not the same thing. And, and they shouldn't be criminalized in the same and targeted in the same way. Um, but unfortunately, the way our, our press has handled these things, the way the, the opposition party has handled this, and the conservative party in particular, uh, has tended to to raise a hue and cry in these things. This is really unfortunate. And I will end with 
you know, the problem is that we're, we're having now leading to a kind of McCarthyite uh, red scare, which is with racial overtones. And that's what's going on today. Um, and I would end with a story that most of, of the people who know China and the, the audience would know very well. The story of Chen Shui Sung. Chen Shui Sung was a brilliant scientist who was tagged from MIT and then Caltech, who was recruited to study the German V2 rocket program at the end of World War II and the advances in German rocketry science. In 1950, as part of the Red Scare, he was suddenly deprived of his security clearance and basically hounded out of academia. Subsequently, he made his way to China and he's the father of the Long March rocket program, which put China into space. And this is the kind of thing which may go on today. And in the case of, of Dr. Cho Sangguo, she was making great advances, which Canada could have used, but misused. And instead she's been targeted. So I think that we, A, we must, we must uh, be vigilant, as Dr. Fang thing, vigilant, about racialization, that we have a sad history, and in terms of this, this merging of political quality and, and uh, security with racialized profiling and merging of individuals with the nature of the Chinese state. And uh, as a Canadian, I really want, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, let me say, is that we should not be trying to use the methods that we criticize in China in order to deal with our own citizens and our own scientists. What happens with securitization is that we actually adopt mirror image um, controls like those that exist in China, except in a racialized form. Of course, not all Canadians get targeted, but certain Canadians get targeted for heightened surveillance. Um, and th and this, this is shameful. It contradicts the notion that we are the free world and liberal countries. And it puts us in a position where we have no room to criticize China for its policies because we're doing exactly the same thing. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Patio, for your very balanced perspective and inputs. Um, I'm aware of time, so let's move on to the last discussant, um, Dr. John Price. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor Da, and I want to congratulate Professor uh, Jenny Lee and uh, Xiao Jie Li uh, for a fabulous uh, project and a wonderful publication uh, that has served the uh, Chinese American uh, and the broader Chinese uh, North American and indeed uh, the global diaspora in so many ways. And, and I really want to, uh, as we say in indigenous territory uh, these days, raise my hands to you and congratulate you uh, for that work. It's very important. And it is a wonderful and a shining example of uh, community-based approaches uh, to research and teaching, which I think is very, very important. So, um, I won't take uh, too much time. I just want to uh, make a couple of points and raise a couple of questions that I hope that we can get to. Uh, the first point I would say is that um, uh, I, I think it's always difficult to compare the United States and Canada. In some ways, um, you know, with Trump in power, uh, the China uh, initiative, and it, it was very vulgar racism. Uh, in, in, in Canada, the situation is different in some ways. But I would just underscore the fact that um, uh, Vancouver was cited as the, uh, as, uh, the uh, North American capital of uh, anti-Asian hate crimes in America. Uh, and so the question of anti-Asian, anti-Chinese hate is one that has uh, both a contemporary uh, presence as well as historic uh, ramifications that run very, very deep. 
uh, along with the, the historic denial of the existence of racism in Canada. We always point to the United States as where racism exists compared to here in Canada where we are so innocent. I think that, um, uh, so in that sense, I think where we are in, 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 in Canada today in terms of anti-Asian racism and the impact on research and in professors in the academy, um, is both uh, sort of, it's different, but it is uh, in, in some senses actually where the United States is going to now with the new changes announced with the uh, initiative, uh, the China initiative, they're saying, okay, we're not gonna target anybody, uh, you know, but of course behind the scenes, what's, what's really going on, right? And that's what's happening effectively in Canada. And that was the guidelines that CSIS put out uh, when they decided that they had to have a security screen for all applications to NSERC in certain categories, uh, they said, oh, well, this is not targeted at any one group, it's uh, for everybody. And uh, we're, you know, any country can be a security threat. Of course, that's the camouflage. And so I think in the United States, they're moving towards a more sophisticated uh, approach uh, in, do in doing the same thing. Um, so, I think that one of the things that I would say also is that um, it is important to look at this impact on uh, the chill on uh, in, in the universities, but it's also uh, important to keep in mind that the anti-Asian racism uh, and racism is directed uh, also at uh, black and indigenous communities uh, are very important. And the, you know, it's not just academics that are affected. Um, you know, the, uh, the young Asian people, young Asian women who are being attacked in the streets uh, on the buses. Uh, this is something that is continuing uh, to happen. Um, recently, there was just a young woman who was attacked in a park, um, uh, Asian Canadian woman uh, sexually molested. Uh, these things are continually happening. Um, uh, indigenous women are continually being attacked. And, and so I think that we need to you know, look at these issues from a fairly broad scope. Um, I must raise my hands to the many activists in uh, the Asian Canadian communities and indigenous and black communities who have stood up and organized. And so we have new organizations, uh, anti-hate organizations in Canada that have arisen. Um, and we, I think, are, are you know, those people are, are you know, are, are doing a tremendous job as you have done with your research. So thank you for that. I want to mention quickly that um, we, uh, because of the particular nature of Sinophobia and its impact <clears throat> on Canadian foreign policy, a number of us, both academics and community people, came together to form a new project called uh, Canada-China focus, uh, and we've begun doing education to raise the question of Sinophobia, uh, racism, and the impact on uh, China, uh, Canada-China relations. And I'm just going to put in the chat um, a uh, the website. Uh, you can go to www.ccfocus.ca uh, and get some of the materials that we're starting to put out and do uh, some of the things that you've already done. So in a sense, you act as a model. Quickly to the questions, uh, the question of neo-racism. I like the, uh, you know, the framework that you've established. I want to raise the question of neo-racism uh, and the, the, the theoretical questions related to that because uh, my understanding of racism as a theoretical you know, idea is that racism has always been contingent, has always been changing. So when we start putting neo-racism in front of racism, what is it that you're pointing to in particular? Is there a certain stage here that we're at? Uh, so that's one of the questions. Uh, the other question I have is, yes, is, you know, how, you know, what about the international ramifications? Uh, did any of your respondents raise some of these things? Like, for instance, here in Canada, as uh, Jeremy said, we are uh, concerned about the five eyes, the uh, security intelligence agencies that exist uh, worldwide. And no doubt the uh, China initiative, uh, you know, was circuited through that process. And we see that going on on so many levels in terms of anti-China propaganda. So those are a couple of the questions. I'll leave it there. And thank you so much again for your research and for your presentation today. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Price. Um, I wonder whether Dr. Lee and Shouti do you have anything to say in response to Dr. Price's comments? 
Um, yes, I mean, excellent comments from everyone. I can sit around and talk to each of you for quite some time, I'm sure. But just the, the latest question, what is new uh, about neo-racism? And it, it, maybe it's not that new, but it really is a way to differentiate from racism in a globalizing world where someone of my an American accent uh, and an American may not have the same kind of discrimination uh, that one might encounter versus an international student or an international scholar. Under the banner of racism, all Asians are treated the same. And we know that that is not true, especially for our immigrant communities that are even more vulnerable. And so it's a way to distinguish that, but also to say that there is a hierarchy. There's an assumed global hierarchy that we also need to pay attention to in ways that we make it very easy for those from some to come get a work visa, come into our country and others that where it's almost impossible to enter our borders. And so it's a way, it's an attempt to differentiate that, but also interesting enough, used as a way to maintain our own sense of identity. So historically this concept was used um, as a, in trying to understand why are the French so racist against the, the, the Arabs, those from North Africa and from the Middle East. And the rationale that was used at the time is that, well, they threaten our French identity. The Europeans can come because we can maintain what it means to be French. But when the Middle Easterners come, that changes it and they are a threat, right? So this idea that in the US that the Chinese, the, the, the Muslim majority countries, those in Mexico, um, stereotypes that are associated with that are is not just racism, but it's a new kind of racism that's used to justify racism. So it's a roundabout way. Um, but um, the other question, and maybe this is not a direct answer, but hopefully the lesson from the US to other countries is that this was a very expensive and failed social experiment because it was under this hypothesis that we would find systematic um, collabor uh, systematic uh, attempts that from the CCP using Chinese scientists and graduate students and they're all spying and they're all in these Confucius centers and through collab and all these different ways, right? And that was the rhetoric that was used by the FBI and leaders in, in our federal government to justify this horrible initiative. Well, we didn't find evidence to support that case. Hopefully that will be a lesson for other countries. I say expensive, meaning that as Xiaoji talked about, I mean, professional lives were devastated. People left the country. There's a chilling effect in all forms. Scientists are afraid to collaborate. They, it's not worth the risk. They'd rather do small studies because they already have tenure in our country. And so why, why go through that? And I think the big question moving forward is how much of that chilling effect will linger because we also know that microaggressions still exist. Racism, neo-racism is still alive. It's not just in the courthouse. It happens every day in labs and classrooms in, in, in our universities. And so hopefully this will show that, you know, sometimes policies can um, throw it, you know, kind of put a big wrench, but also set us back even further back than when, when the policy was conceived. But thanks for your questions. Great. Uh, thank you so much for all of you.